to be organized with our time. We don't need a corporate mindset where every second is an output. We are living beings. We are connected to a vine and having fruit. We want God to do a work within us. You know, there's, there's one sound, though, that still gets me when it comes to time. It's so annoying. Would you guys like to hear it? Go ahead and hit it. Oh, man. <sighs> That hurts. Time to straight my truck. You know, that's what I think every time I get up. Um, and then we have money. We're going to be talking about money. And here's my debit card, which I forgot last night. I went through Culver's after giving this illustration and had to use my cash. That was really harmful because that was cash I had saved up from something else. And Kelly's not going to give me that cash back. And uh, uh, here's my debit card. Okay. So in this, some people are given five, two, and one. And you'll learn that the amount that you're giving isn't that important. It's how you maximize those talents. So we're going to walk through this parable with Jesus about investing our lives in every way. Could you give a round of applause to our people? Thank you. Just lay them down right here in order. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. That was very helpful. Um, I was just going to attach those to the bags. I bought this at Walmart yesterday. I didn't realize I bought 42-inch balloons, so I needed human props because my illustration wouldn't work out. The story we're about to hear is in Matthew 25. There are three parables that are told. And within those three parables, it's told about what we will do at the end of time. Matthew 24 talks about the end of the world, what will happen at the end of time. The parables in Matthew 25 tell us how to get ready for the end of time. Basically, the parable that I'm going to walk you through today is it about giving an account at the end of your life. Now, so I thought about that. When have I been summoned to open the books of my life, to share what I've done, to look at my life as a whole, every aspect in my life, and say, okay, I'm going to report on this. The first one I can remember is in third grade parent-teacher conference. I told a lie. My teacher told my mom when I said, I got in trouble. Miss Langworthy was a very scary individual, and I was afraid of her. I was afraid to go back to class because she had caught me in a lie. Um, but most recently, it would probably be when Kelly travels out of town. Um, she makes long lists of things for me to do, uh, to take care of the house, the animals, the plants, and our feral children the way that she would. Um, and she takes care of all those things a little bit better than I would. And she, she's nicer to the kids with this regard. If Elliot doesn't like what we're eating that night, she might help him out with something else. Or she would have forethought for that, that he might not like that. I serve dinner at 6, and if you don't eat, that's tough luck. And I'm going to bed after that. Uh, uh, you should have ate chicken. KFC is perfectly appropriate for a 9-year-old eating. Like, hey, move on with your life. Um, so she was out of town, and, and the boys get really pumped when she leaves. They're like, guys night, we're sleeping in the basement together, we're going to watch movies, we're going to have fun. Two days later, they're crying for mom in every, kind of, every which way because they're like, this dude obviously doesn't know what he's doing. And I remember she was actually at a conference with another group of ladies, and uh, I didn't know these ladies or that. I had went to bed, and they woke up, and they called mom on FaceTime crying like, he's not taking care of us, he's not feeding us, he's not all these things. And they're in my room while they're saying this. Well, I sleep really heavy. And one of them does a butt bomb on top of my head. I wake up mad, right? And so I'm there uh, in my shorts. I don't have a shirt on. Beautiful picture. And I just start trying to grab them. Like, hey, go to bed. Told you to get in bed. You know, all this stuff. And what I didn't know is they were on FaceTime. And these five ladies from this church that I didn't even know were on the back. And I'm just running around. Rah, rah, <laughs> get in bed. And when she get home, I'm like, it's like three children standing there giving an account for, did you water the plants? How are my animals? What just like, hey, we're alive. We're alive. We made it good. So hopefully our faithfulness to Jesus is a little bit better experienced than that. And we're going to walk through this parable to give an account for our lives of every aspect. Very challenging, very rewarding. Let's start with the parable. Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 through 30. And we're going to take a chunk at a time. It will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. It's talking about Jesus. We're the servants in this story. Jesus is the one who's went on a long journey. He's came down to heaven, and now he's gone back to the Father, and he's entrusting us with our lives. Which brings me to our first point. We need to take inventory of every aspect of our lives and ask this question. Here's the big question. 
Does Jesus have lordship over those things? Do we view our lives as we own it? Or is it a gift that we're stewarding? Or are our possessions our possessions? Are they God? And we're allowing him to use that as we enjoy them. It is a biblical question that everyone must ask as they follow Christ. Again, we're the servants. He's the master. To some, he's given five, two, and one, and so on. And what matters here is that you invest and maximize those gifts. So we need to evaluate and take um, inventory of what God has given us. But the deeper question is, does he have lordship over all those areas? Again, I pulled out of the bag. Our relationship with him. Our relationships of marriage, of children, and our singleness, of friends, our, our small group, and our community. How do we invest in those? But you need to know this. This is a biblical principle. Psalm 24.1. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. So if you are new to Christianity, this might be shocking. If you follow Christ, your life is not your own. Everything that you have is his. The very eyeballs you have are his. The breath in your lungs, the TVs at home. Where are you going to be today at 12? Isn't there a Packers game? Did I miss that? Okay, maybe I get better information. I know a lot of you came to nine, so you didn't be there at 12. Like, oh, this is awesome. Just remember, when you're watching the Packers game, that is all the Lord's. And as we're the servants in this story, that the master's given different amounts of what people have, sets those boundaries, and we are called to steward those, to invest those, to maximize those. But let's be clear. Jesus is the king of kings, and Jesus is the Lord of lords. He is the master of this story, and we are... The servants, and everything that you have is his. So what do we do with that? Have you answered that question of lordship? Have you submitted that God is not a part of your life, but he's all of your life, and everything that you have is his? Have you answered that question? He is the Lord of every aspect of your life, which brings me to the next point. After you've taken inventory, answered a question about lordship in that, Christians are called to cultivate every area of their life. Let's continue on in the parable. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on a journey. The man who had received the five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gave and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, but dug a hole in the ground and hid the master's money. You see, after taking inventory and after lordship has been decided, we must be faithful to cultivate every talent, every spiritual gift, every natural ability, every relationship, and, show up, and so on. We as Christians are not called to walk through life without a name without a purpose, without the end in mind, we are called to be fruitful in all of these things. He has a lot for us to do in all the areas of our life according to what we have and according to our spiritual ability. But make no mistake, hear this. He wants all of you. Now, if you're struggling with the extreme nature of this sermon... That's okay, because it is extreme. It is hard. And make no mistake that Jesus has some crazy claims. If you read it from a human perspective and natural eyes, what Jesus asks of us is hard. It is a lot. It is everything. And he's, he's plain when he says, if, if you guys only want part of me, if you don't want all of me, you're not worthy of me. Whew. He's not looking for a tip. He's not looking for you to straddle a fence. He wants you to be a fully devoted follower of him. So why might you be confused? Because some people have confused cultural Christianity with biblical Christianity. You need to go back and read the claims of Jesus and what he's called his people to do. Biblical Christianity doesn't follow the American dream all the time. It's not about... Um, safety and comfort and saving up enough money so that we can have all the things that we want. He's bid us to come and die, to follow him. He's called us to suffer. He's called us to take the gospel to the ends of the worlds at whatever cost. 
And, and you can struggle with that. And I've struggled with how to communicate this to you. So let me give you a couple thoughts that might help. As I ultimately think about giving all of our life to him, I am struck by the totality of his love for us. Again, I've wrestled with this, how to be graceful and how not to lighten the imperative or the call. Giving your life to him in every area is hard and it will require work. And it is easy to see God in improper light. And this is where people like throw insults at Christians, at the church, or at God's call in general. But here's the truth. He doesn't want to leave any stone unturned in your life because if he did, that part of your life would not be redeemed by his love. You would not find out how much he cares for you in that area. God is not a mean taskmaster who's trying to extract everything out of you. You're not just another number. It's not that he doesn't care about you. He loves you so much, he wants to breathe life into every area of your life. He wants to love you deeply. Romans 12.1 puts both of these thoughts together. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of what? To offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. There it is. That, that's the hard part. But it's in view of his mercy. Holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. And so I want you to read. I want you to think. I want you to take inventory and consider doing this. But in view that you're the one who's going to be blessed in every one of these scenarios. Not God. And what's going to happen? He's going to take your soul as you invest that. If you invest in your relationship with him and other people, if you invest your resources, you're not just a worker who goes to work and punches in and does work for corporate America or some factory and it doesn't matter. You are a called Christian full of salt and light. And if you give your life to him in that way, what's going to happen? He's going to cultivate something in you. You're going to see something called spiritual maturity begin to take place. And listen, it's hard. God has a big pair of pruning shears. And you start cultivating this in your life, he's going to tell you to stop doing some things. And when he does that, he's going to clip off some branches of your life. And guess what? It just doesn't feel good. There's no other way to say that. It hurts. When God says, stop doing this, this is not loving, this is not good, this is not wholesome, this is not holy, and he cuts down your life, it hurts to have him prune you. Sometimes God's going to come with you with a shovel. Some of you have just bad practices in your life that do not aim with the goal of meeting your Savior who is also your Lord. And he's going to bring that shovel and he's going to start digging weeds around you. And you're going to have to deal with being addicted to alcohol. You're going to have to deal with wasting your money. You're going to have to, to deal with yelling or being angry, not treating the relationships you have in your life, not giving time the glory and the weight that he deserves. He's going to make you spiritually mature. Some of you are going to decide like, you know what? I need to invest in the community that I'm a part of. I need to grow relationally with other people so I won't be alone, depressed, and I can be encouraged. And when you cultivate that, when you cultivate those relationships, what's going to happen is you're going to be flooded with hope and joy. Some of you need to invest in your kids this year. This is the year that you parent your children in the Lord, that your table looks different when you eat and you pray. Some marriages need to be restored. You need to deeply invest in your family. Some marriages need to invest in intimacy and growth and joy. Some of these households need to be given to the Lord in all these ways. When you go to work, you need to cultivate your witness of being the most faithful employee. Empl employee, employee. You don't work at a cheese factory factory, you work at a church that makes cheese. God wants to do a work in you in every aspect of your life, giving of your time, your resources in your life. And when you do it, God will start to cultivate something beautiful and good and pleasing in every way. Let me share with you a few examples of this beautiful kingdom cultivation. Our staff. I want to let you know that the team of people that work here work hard for you. And honestly, we have pushed them so hard to grow themselves, to be holy, to be loving, to care about people in the right light. 
you are our joy, our work, and our desires to see you become spiritually mature. That's the whole reason they're here. And I want you to know our beautiful staff, our loving, hardworking staff, they are letting God cultivate in them. They are cultivating in other people. And friends, you have a wonderful team of people who oversee the church. And I'm just so proud of our team. Could you, could you show your appreciation to them by a round of applause? So I asked some of those wonderful, industrious people, who are some people that you see here who are just cultivating beautiful things? Chad Louts, our new family pastor, who's just crushing it. Talked about a woman named Melissa, Melissa Larson. She volunteers at a small group in RC Kids each week at the 11 a.m. service. Her consistency and devotion to the kids causes the kids to feel comfortable and willing to share what's on their hearts. Thank you to all the children's workers who are cultivating to our most precious commodity, our next generation. We're going to love them and care for them in every way. Sam Ducat, he works on a production team. Z said he's a faithful pillar for our production team for almost a decade, if not more. His stability and consistency are an example to us all. He will be stepping into a lead role soon, and I believe he will grow more than ever with creative license and a platform to love others well. Thank you for all those who work on the production team. Uh, that story I told you from the Pope to Easter, you had a part in that, and we appreciate it. I talked to Jen Ivlin. Uh, we, we have this building that is our, our greatest resource financially and what we take care of. It, it's a place for the community to enjoy. It costs a lot of money, uh, one, to purchase this, to build this, but also to maintain it and keep it nice. And it's a resource that we do not worship, but we also need to steward well. These people, babe. Thome, Tara McGiffin, Mike Kachera, Jerry Manier, Caleb Johnson, Nate Swan, Eric Barkley, and Joe Glazer, they take care of this building. They, they, they plan out long projects. They help clean this building. They're, they're always looking. Stuff breaks. We use this building a lot. There's hardly a night of the week that people from the community or this church are not using this building. We're rough on this building, and they take care of it. And I just want to uh, give God thanks right now for what he's provided for Red Cedar Church to these people in so many ways. I'm just so thankful. As I was praying, there's two more people that came to mind. Uh, one is Bryce and the other one is Jevin Miller. They're, they're two young adults. And I, I love these two men. They're in their early 20s, I believe, or right at 20. And I hear them out in the lobby all the time meeting with the young adults. And they're like, philosopher thinkers and they love God's word and I listen to him share the gospel with other young men and I think what a light I just love how they're cultivating that and other people our young adult ministries our 20s to 29 year olds they're growing because Bryce and Jevin are stepping up and leading in every way friends Here's what I tell you about God. I don't care if you know how to play the trumpet. I don't care if you know how to dig holes well. I don't care if you know how to run a business. If you give to God what he has in your life, he'll cultivate it and make it fruitful. He uses everything and anything. Which brings me to my last point. I want you to recognize that Jesus is the reward. It's not about the talents themselves. Verse 19 after a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. Why? Jesus is coming back. The question today, are you ready? Do you have the proper mindset? The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you've entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I've gained five more. His master replied, well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Here's the reward. Come and share your master's happiness. Wow. Verse 22, the man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you've entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I've gained two more. His master replied, and can't you wait to hear these words? Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with the few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. You see, 
these servants realized it wasn't about the talents they had received. It was about a relationship with their master themselves. They understood who he was. They understood that God is the master gardener. That from the very beginning of time, he has said, be fruitful and go multiply. It's not okay for us just to take care of ourselves. It's not okay for this church just to be happy and, and live in this world and be okay within itself. We have an outward focus to be fruitful, to be faithful, and to cultivate these things. But more importantly, as we do this, as you join God in his project, as you join God in his mission, if you will, you have a deeper relationship with him. But here's the big takeaway. And I think here's where we get messed up. Do I have these right? I don't think so, but one's five, one's two. Okay. There you go. <laughs> this really is messing me up today. All right, all right. Um, we stare at these. Are they right, Jen? Are these right? That? <laughs> Woo! Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Will someone come help me? <laughs> Here we go. We're going to get this. All right, all right, all right. I see. I was staring at the five. Here we go. Whatever, I give up. I don't care. <laughs> they don't matter. They're stupid. <laughs> no. um, see, we stare at the five and the two, and I want you to see something very deep about this parable. Jesus didn't care about how much they had. It was about what they did with what they had. And you know what our you know what our deepest sin is as people is we compare. We get jealous of people who have five or two or even one. And as I, as, I, as I process you guys, and I thought about this message, and I thought about how hard it is, and, and I know we're talking about money. I also thought about there's some of you who might be sitting here thinking today, and I've just never had anything good. I grew up in a house that wasn't nice or loving. I've struggled ever since. Like, what do, what do I have to give to God? And that can be hard. And, and, and I identify with you. Uh, recently, I've been uh, looking at husky dogs and malamutes because I'm a daydreamer, right? This is what I do with my stress. I daydream about hobbies that I'll probably never do. And um, my latest daydream is to own some husky dogs so I can have my own sled dog team. I think that would be absolutely <laughs> outstanding. Contacted a few people. It might be a more of a reality than I thought. But anyway... Um, if you buy them as puppies, it takes two years before you'll be able to go out. And I'm just kind of impatient. Like, do I want to invest a, do I want to walk dogs three miles a day for two years before I get to do with them what I want to do? And I don't even know if our house is big enough. Can they live in a barn? So I'm asking all these questions, right? So I, I got a bright idea one day. I was like, what about some rescue dogs? And so I start reading about them because, you know, these dogs are older. They need a home. But you start reading their behavior issues and they're like, might bite you. Uh, Choose holes and walls. Really loving guy, though. You know, it's like, all right, these guys have some problems. And then I start thinking about, you know, God, I'm a rescue dog. Um, you know, as, as I came to God, my resume wasn't beautiful or sweet or a lot of talents in the bad to give to him. It was a lot of trauma, a lot of hurt, a lot of disobedience, a lot of sinful living. And I want you to know this today. For those of you who are in pain... I dare you to offer him up all that hurt and watch what he does with it. And this is hard for me to say. No matter what that pain is, his love is greater and he can use it. And you're going to be the, don't let the enemy use what has been done to you to take away your faith. Let God's love be used to grow your faith. And friends, we've got to stop comparing it's not if you have five talents or two talents. We need everyone at this church on mission with a generous heart, with a relationship with him, with the resources, with their time, with the relationships with other people. Because you know what God cares about at the end of the day? Other people. And it's not about what we get out of it. It's not about who gets the glory. It's about joining in Jesus' happiness to love others well. Listen to how serious he takes it. Let's finish up this parable. Verse 24. The man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, 
I know that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here's what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. Let that weigh on you. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I return, I would have received it back with interest. Why is Jesus saying this so harshly? Because his love for people is so great, he wants us to cultivate every part. He wants these people to feel loved and cared for. He wants them discipled. He, wants, he doesn't want kids to grow up not knowing that they're loved and they're cared for. Basically, this person didn't know, did not reflect on God's love and mercy and his care for other people. So that continues. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags. For whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The ultimate pain of this story is to live maybe in a cultural Christianity or not a Christianity at all. And you get to heaven and God doesn't even know who you are. And you'll be cast from his presence. Now, You really have to put your listening ears on for the next couple minutes because I want to be very clear. You could hear this passage and walk, walk away from today's sermon with some really bad thoughts and theology. And let's just make clear. Are you listening? Okay. This message is not an earn your salvation message. It's not do a bunch of more stuff so you can get into heaven. If you're a workaholic or go getter, this message could mess you up. You'd be like, oh, I'm going to do more. I'm going to give God. God's going to be so much more proud of me if I just go after it. Some of you that have anxiety or who struggle or who are struggling in life, this sermon could put such a weight on you that could take away from your assurance of your salvation. You need to take time to think about this. Here's what the sermon is saying. That the stuff we do comes out of our relationship with God. You see, we have an invisible faith. And there must be fruit out of that faith. If you believe that Christ went on a journey to heaven is coming back from you, then you need to get to work with that faith. And you need to cultivate. You need to give God the little that you have so he can give you a lot. You need to trust in him. But friends, if you're not doing anything, it shows that you have an invisible lack of faith. And there's no fruit. You're not cultivating. You're not taking any steps. You're not going for it in any way. And God desires more for his people. So I believe that you could be, find yourself in a few different categories. Maybe you're here today and you are cultivating these things. Don't put more weight on yourself. Keep surrendering. Keep praying. Keep growing. And we applaud you for everything that you're doing. Maybe some of you understand the doctrine, the theology, and maybe once in your life you were living this out, but because of circumstance or the world, you've been kind of lulled to sleep. Today's a revival day for you. God, I'm going to allow you to cultivate. I'm going to listen over the next few weeks about relationships, time, resources, um, my relationship with other people, and God, I'm going to build a vision over the next three or four weeks what you're calling me to cultivate in 2024. I'm going to decide, God, I'm going to be strategic. I'm going to plan. I'm going to give you a greater part of my life and cultivate and be faithful to that so I can have kingdom fruitfulness. I wonder if there's some of you in here who don't know him at all today, who all of this sounds foreign to. Basically, you live your life for yourself. You don't know this master. You do what you want, when you want, and how you want. And you've never bowed the knee to Jesus Christ as master. Here's what I'd like to tell you. And you're missing out on a wonderful relationship. As the Novaks testified earlier about giving, it's not about the actual money. It's about having a relationship with him. And I can just tell you from a very broken life, uh, as I described earlier, a rescue dog kind of life, that accepting Jesus was the single greatest decision that I've ever made. But it goes beyond a savior. When you call him Lord and you do what he says, 
you will discover his infinite love 